competition. First up, we have Winston Priest, who has not slept with anybody famous. Um, one of the co-editors of the Cambridge Tab, he's here tonight basically just for the free dinner because our previous speaker broke their leg in three places. Um, next up, we have Graham Nichols, who's an author, acclaimed installation artist, and the founder of polyamory.org.uk, a leading resource for the UK's polyamorous community. His views on relationships have been featured in books such as Polyamory in the 21st Century, and on the BBC, In the Times, and the, and the, in the Independent. William Longrey is a family law partner with Charles Ross. He specialises in particular in international divorces and the resulting financial issues, and his lectures are written widely on many aspects of family law. He is currently the European President of the International Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers. Speaking for the opposition, we have Richard Kane, who is the foundation of Marriage Resource, which provides services and counselling for married couples around the world from the 7th to the 14th of February each year. Anastasia Duval is Deputy Director and Head of Family Policy at the Think Tank Civitas. Think Tank Civitas. She is a qualified primary school teacher, journalist for the Guardian and the New Statesman, and has written widely on the importance of marriage in modern society. Last up for the opposition, we have Anne Atkins, who is an author and journalist. She was the Telegraph's first ever agony aunt, and has also written for the Guardian, the Daily Mail, and the Express. She is a prominent supporter of Christian values, and is a regular contributor to Radio 4's Good uh, evening. Uh, I'd just like to let you all know that I'm not Sarah Simmons. Uh, I never had an affair with Gordon Ramsay, and uh, I'm sure if I did, it would be an interesting experience nonetheless. But uh, let's get on with this debate. Um, the motion of tonight is that this house would not get married. And we contend that marriage is merely a symbolic myth uh, masquerading as a romantic ideal of the perfect human relationship and natural home for creating happy families. This myth is underpinned by five great lies, and I will tackle each in turn. The first lie is a suggestion that this house would benefit from getting married. This is blatantly untrue. The Cambridge Union will derive no benefit whatsoever from getting married. It is never married and it is managed pretty well on its own without trying, tying the knot with the Oxford Union or any other debating chamber on that matter. Um, that in itself is a good enough reason for me um, why we should bother with marriage. Um, line number two, uh, marriage creates serious long-term relationships. Whenever we think of marriage, we think of wedding marches, a bouquet being launched into the desperate flailing arms of a group of teary bridesmaids, the best man trolleyed off his face, all that corny stuff. Um, but looking past um, the trivial activities of the ceremony, however, is an actual fact, a very cold, a very boring, and a very unromantic contract binding two individuals together, making them financially liable upon each other. Um, that, in, the, in essence, is what marriage is, um, nothing more and nothing less. Um, some may argue that marriage is more than that. It's about providing an incentive to remain committed to the unlucky person you decide to spend your rest of your life with. Um, however, to, such a, to take such a stance is to value marriage as an abstract symbol, um, not for its substance. Um, couples get married to, provide, to prove their devotion, not only to themselves, but to the public as well. Yet, why should couples feel the need to express their commitment to each other in such an express manner? Is it based, is it based on some inherent insecurity? If they already have a solid relationship built, built on trust and love, surely that should suffice. There shouldn't be a need to bring bureaucracy into the equation. Imposing a, a legal contract in an attempt to emotionally um, bind individuals together is artificial. Love is a feeling that, uh, which cannot be controlled um, by the intellectual constructs of a mere contract. It's easy to say, uh, for someone to say, I do, when they are gazing deeply into the, a pair of infatuated eyes. What many fail to realise, however, is that at the, at, at the time, is um, how irritated they will be um, with the other half. Um, her relentless nagging and her sagging breasts, um, or his balding scalp and his a diminishing sexual performance. Um, these are just a brief
brief sample of factors which contribute towards the natural breakdown in uh, long-term relationships. Um, marriage can do any uh, preventing of this. Um, sometimes people just fall out of love. Um, it's a sad reality. In, Ma in America, where 97% of the population claims you're religious, a shocking 50% of first marriages end in divorce. In the UK, um, things aren't much better. In fact, I actually phoned up uh, Ladbrokes um, this morning, and I was given odds of two to one that my marriage um, would not last beyond 10 years. It's disgusting. Um, the, very, the, the very essence of marriage, um, that is the commitment of a lifelong relationship, allow, um, has been totally undermined. Indeed, uh, we don't have to look any further than the royal family, um, the epitome, which is the epitome of Christian values, um, to realise that the breakdown in relationships is part and parcel of life. For a start, Henry VIII um, practically invented uh, the concept of divorce. Um, moreover, all of the Queen's children, including Prince Andrew, um, Prince Charles, and even Princess Anne, um, have divorced. It is a regret that Her Royal Majesty um, has been unable to inculcate marriage uh, values into her children. Um, and this is without the societal pressures of, of normal, everyday working life. This is work and money not affected by it whatsoever, and if the royal family can't keep their relationships alive, how can we? Um, <laughs> uh, with the, with the ever-increasing occurrence of divorce looming over our heads, society has accustomed itself to overcome this phenomenon. The introduction of prenuptial agreements, for example, reflects people's increasing awareness about the risks involved in entering marriages. Um, if you love each other unconditionally, then there should be no need to take um, what is effectively an insurance policy on your partner. Um, such practical honesty completely undermines the very principle of trust and faithfulness so cherished upon entering marriage. Not only has modern society recognised such equality, however, um, the big man himself, a.k.a. God, um, has too. From a very early stage, God realised that these unusual creatures he created were a bit of a promiscuous bunch. Um, thus he laid down the law, thou shalt not commit adultery. Um, if marriage is so great, then why warn of this? Presuming we were all married, every man in this chamber, and many women too, would wish to come up with adultery all the time. <laughs> Contrary to the romantic idealism portrayed in Hollywood and Disney, um, getting married isn't going to stop us wanting to have sex with other people. Um, who knows what sort of infidelity Cinderella got involved in when she got married? Who can truly say what Snow White got up to with those seven dwarves? <laughs> uh, marriage imposes sexual boundaries on those who simply cannot resist. Indeed, studies in London reveal that 50% of prostitutes' clients were married men. Much to everyone's despair, as well as my own, the debacle of marry, marriage simply isn't having the prohibiting effect it once had, so why bother with it? Uh, moving on to my uh, third point, marriage is good for children. That's a lie. Why on earth should, we, why on earth should this be the case? Whether or not their parents are married, children will feel secure so long as their parents clearly demonstrate that they are engaged in a healthy and committed relationship. Children whose parents are engaged in a bitter relationship will have the same concerns whether or not their parents are married. The artificiality of a marriage contract is unlikely to provide much reassurance for a child. Even children realise that marriage doesn't stop people splitting up. Given that divorce is so commonplace in modern day society, a child who observes his parents fighting all day is unlikely to be comforted by the fact that they are bound together by some contract. Indeed, once the parents do divorce, as they so often do, the psychological effects that this imposes upon a child could in fact be a lot worse. Divorce represents a symbolic, irremediable and final breaking of a mutual relation. Separation between a married parent, on the other hand, does not carry the same disastrous implications. Line number four, marriage is beneficial for women. Germaine Greer, uh, one of the most significant feminist voices in the later 20th century, is in agreement with me here. Um, she agrees marriage is a socially sanctioned relationship, and if women truly wish to seek independence, they cannot perceive marriage as a job, it's, it's, so, so as it has so often become. Um, the status of a woman uh, could be measured in terms of uh, their ability to track and snare a man. 
In many cases, women are happy to sacrifice their financial independence, safe in the knowledge that if the marriage ends, they would, never, they would get half of whatever their husband owns. Um, while this may be an easy path um, for many women to follow, it certainly is not the noble one. Um, marriage uh, uh, kind of fails to provide, not kind of, it does, it fails to provide women with the burning ambition to strive for success. Um, if women want to be perceived as equals, um, they, should have be, um, uh, they should avoid marriage at all costs. Um, indeed, marriage has also been regarded as a power contract, imprisoning women within the confines of a domineering alpha male's cage. Um, in the context of certain religions, it has uh, given men a greater sense of confidence in taking the opportunity to physically abuse their wives, um, safe in the knowledge that due to cultural restrictions, it will be practically impossible for their wives to destroy the existing marital ties between them. Um, and my final lie is that marriage represents a natural human condition. Does it really? Um, as much as this may have been preached to us, um, this is not the case. In fact, um, marriage embellishes a detrimental human condition, the triumph of hope over experience. Um, we've always had a long-standing attraction uh, to the belief in the supernatural. However, as many of us know, uh, this is a leap of faith. Broken marriages are evidenced everywhere, and yet people still persist in it. In a study by Jennifer Baker, it has shown that 50% of uh, first marriages, 67% of second, and 74% of third marriages end in divorce. This serves as a perfect illustration of the endearing state of the human condition. Despite the increased likelihood of marriages failing after the first divorce, humans just keep on persisting in the hope that one day they will find thanks, um, their happy ever after. Um, we all find comfort in this. Um, but this is allowing our emotions to override logic. Um, marriage, with its tedious legal ties, um, merely exacerbates this problem. Um, and as can be seen, the, the marriage myth crumbled like a wedding cake. Um, on, on a concluding note, though, um, I would just like to announce that, on a personal level, I do plan on getting married. Um, <laughs> but probably when I'm about 70, um, and even then, she'll probably be someone else's wife. Thank you. Very entertaining, but um, sadly flawed and very gloomy outlook on the idea of marriage. I mean, how depressing. In my uh, experience, it's not quite like that, actually. In fact, the whole idea of marriage is quite exciting. Uh, one of the things that's exciting about it is um, it's something that's going to affect all of us in sitting in this room. You know, if you're not in a marriage, it's likely your parents perhaps were married at some time. You know, you've had experience of marriage. It's very subjective. We've all experienced it for the good or the bad. We're not talking about particle physics. We're talking about something which we all have subjective experience of, which I think makes it very exciting and interesting. And of course it was, it was Bob Geldof who, uh, who said, you know, that marriage is a great institution. But then again, who wants to live in an institution? Well, I do. Actually, an institution that I'm enjoying greatly. So the truth is, the most of us in this room sooner or later, are going to arrange ourselves into sort of a couple relationship. That's, if you'll just bear with me, we'll just carry that along as an assumption here. And the question then is, as you pursue your relationship as a couple, to marry or to remain unmarried? And that's the number of the issue this evening. And the truth is, looking from the outside, as our friend has just suggested, they both look the same. You know, a couple, they share the same bed, the same house, maybe even the same bank account. Who knows? It depends how involved they are. So in order to understand the difference between the types of relationship, because they look the same, we have to turn to, to researchers and academics who have looked into the subject at great length. And even then, the research is flawed. Because in order to do a thorough piece of research, as you all know, you'd have to have a subjective group and cause this group to remain unmarried for all their lives, and the other group to be forced those 
to marry for the rest of their lives, and then you'd have a fair test, but you can't do that. It would be a bit unfair. You wouldn't like to be part of a test like that, would you? Neither would I. So we have to turn to the research, which of course is compelling. So I'm going to move on to research in a minute, but I just want to suggest something at the moment. I'd like to suggest that perhaps you lot, as a group of students here at Cambridge, are fairly ambitious. Is that fair? No? <laughs> well, how about aspirational? You're aspirational, you want to achieve things in life, perhaps you want to have a good career, perhaps you want to become a politician, perhaps you want to you know, leave a legacy for mankind. Perhaps. <laughs> and, and for the sake of argument, I've already suggested, let's assume that at some point you might like to form yourselves as a couple and you may even choose to have a few children. Fairly safe assumption. Bear with me. If that's not you, then you can exclude yourself. But for most of us, that's the way we're going to go. In which case, if you're clever and you want to do that, why would you purposefully disadvantage yourself in life? Because the truth is, if you choose to remain unmarried, that's what you're going to do. Let's look at the statistics here for a minute. First of all, from a child's perspective, if you were a baby being born this evening in Cambridge and you were able to choose, which of course is a ridiculous idea, isn't it? But if you were able to choose, you would always choose to be born to a couple who were married. And the reason why you would always choose to be born into a family where the couple were married is that the likelihood of, of your parents staying together are so much greater. A, a co-opting couple, a, a child will... Um, let's look at the facts. A, a one in three chance of parents splitting before my fifth birthday if I'm born to a cohabiting couple, compared to a 1 in 10 chance of my parents splitting if my parents are married. There's a huge difference there. And of course, a child craves security and stability. That's what they're, that's what they're looking for. It's really important. I'll take some questions in a moment if you don't mind. Therefore, as a child in a single parent household, I would be, these are a bit shocking, and my friend is going to like them, but they're true, 75% more likely to fail at school, 70% more likely to be a drug addict, 50% more likely to have an alcohol problem, 40% more likely to have serious problems with debt, and 35% more likely to experience unemployment and be on welfare and dependency. Okay. This is strong stuff. This is strong stuff. And it may be that this isn't your experience. It may be that your experience is that you're in a co-opting relationship and, and as a child of which you know, you don't have any of these problems. Well, let me tell you, I've done a lot of work with offenders in prison, and I have yet to meet a person in prison who comes from an intact family. But I've met plenty of damaged people who, when you ask them their story, a key part of it was the destruction of the couple unit. And nine times out of ten, the couple unit they were brought into was not married one. I'm sorry if you don't like it, but this is the fact I'm talking about here. begs the question, where are the whole young offenders from intact homes? There aren't any really, with the exception of one who was a brother of mine, a younger brother, who was born into an intact home and ended his life, ended his, well, spent time in prison. So you see, there are exceptions, but what I'm talking about here is in general. So a child, possibly your child, would want you to provide stability, and for your career, you would want a strong personal relationship which are vital, and the strongest of these, statistically, is marriage. So, I could go on. I could go on quoting statistics and statistics all night long, but you know what they say about statistics, we've already heard them. Statistics, lies, and damn statistics or something, isn't it? The key thing is, if it's just a piece of paper, then why is it such a powerful piece of paper that it compels couples to stay together and to endure through hardship? That's the number of the question, isn't it? And to answer that, we turn to the research of one of the world's leading authorities on commitment, Scott Stanley. He's done research into the whole couple dynamic, and he's found a very interesting thing. And that's that when a couple choose to move in together in an unmarried state, what happens is, the, this is in general, and it may be that your experience is exceptional to this, but in general, the woman thinks to herself, this is really it. We're committed. This is it. 
we're starting to nest, you know, thinking to the future. And the man has a different agenda. What goes on in his mind is, this is really convenient, I get all the sex I want, and I get the laundry done. <laughs> you see there's a fundamental change in the attitude. And that attitude has a shaping effect on the dynamic in the relationship. You can't escape from it. The way you enter into it is really important. And conversely, what makes a marriage significant is it's particularly significant for men. Because what a man really finds adheres him into the relationship is the public statement. So he invites his friends, his neighbours, his colleagues from work, his cousins, his relatives, and in front of everybody he says, I'm committed to this person. And the public statement has a defining effect on the relationship and a shaping effect on the relationship. So for men this is really important. Fundamental difference in the world view. Also, marriage, because of that, makes people more likely to plan for the long term, more likely to, to save money, more likely to support each other in education and training, to pursue careers, thinking more in the long term. It, 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 it may be the case uh, that because you guys are clever, you think that you can kind of be immune to all this. Well, it's not the case. It's not about cleverness. It's about commitment. And presently, and I'm sure we're going to hear about this from the lawyer a bit later on, there's a lot of talk about uh, the government intervening, the law commissioner of looked at the whole thing, of, um, of coming with law to regularise a cohabiting relationship, so the responsibilities that go with that. But let me tell you something. It's never going to happen. The reason why it's never going to happen is you can't define what a cohabiting relationship is. So if I live in a student house, as I expect lots of you do, are we all cohabiting together? I don't think so. I imagine a couple of aged aunts living in a little cottage with a white fence. Are they cohabiting? No, they're not. It's also incredibly illiberal, because it may be that I, I may be uh, a, a couple and we may positively choose to remain unmarried. So what is the government doing foisting responsibilities on us in this liberal age? That is completely illiberal and it isn't ever going to happen. So, in conclusion, I hope I've shown you that for yourself, professionally, for socially, and for any children that you may have, a marriage is going to give you a level of security and stability which is far beyond a co and loose beauty relationship. It's a superbly engineered, inexpensive and effective social institution. And basically, if indeed uh, it didn't exist, we would have to invent it. So I implore you to vote against the motion this evening, unless of course you're a law student, in which case I understand that might be difficult. Thank you. saying maybe we can't make a lot of those assumptions that we just heard. Maybe we can't assume that it's just going to be a two-person relationship. Maybe we can't assume that some people are going to stay together and then have children. Maybe we're talking about a lesbian relationship. Maybe we're talking about a gay relationship. Maybe we should also think about what marriage actually means, what it represents. We heard that it seems on the surface to represent the same thing to be two people locked into some kind of committed relationship. But what is the history of marriage? What does marriage represent? For, for centuries, women have fought to overcome the restrictions that marriage placed upon them. Um, marriage in the 1900s meant that a woman could not be educated. It meant that a woman did not have property. It meant that a woman was essentially chattel a piece of property owned by her father and then exchanged to her future husband. What, what we have is not a symbol of love and not a symbol of joy, commitment and the things that we're given to believe, but in fact a symbol of oppression, 
a symbol of limitation and a symbol of restriction, a symbol of human beings being turned into contracts rather than basing their relationships on real, genuine love. Um, as someone who represents the polyamorous position, I also believe that love should be about openness, communication, and non-possessiveness, and marriage has never represented that. It has always been a sim symbol of limitation and restriction. Even rape was considered acceptable in marriage in this country up until 1991. Um, in some parts of the United States, a rapist can still defend his position on the basis that his wife consented to the marriage. What we, what we have is a system that is not about love, not about any of the things that we've just heard. We also have a completely unequal system. We have a system that <coughs> lesbian and gays cannot get married. There's, there's civil partnerships in some countries in the world, but for much of the world it still remains that there is not that option. And in this country we still have marriage limited <coughs> only to heterosexual couples. We also have marriage rates at the lowest in, in history. At, at the, the last census we had something like 16 to, to every thousand people getting married, whereas in the, in the past that was as high as 50. Marriage is, is essentially becoming an outdated mode of society. It was never and will never be again what it was in the past. It had to be restrictive and it had to be controlling in order for it to operate and exist in the way that it did. Even some people that we consider as great examples of, of um, English history, such as Florence Nightingale, actively attacked marriage during her life, um, but was never able to openly say it. Her book on the subject was never published. Um, we essentially had a system of slavery um, and still to this day as a polyamorous person I could not get married I could not have any kind of union with, with my relationships um, infidelity too is, is something that continues endlessly um, most people are non-monogamous at most at some point in their life and many relationships continue to be non-monogamous. Um, the, only, the only thing that defines them as being married is a contract, a piece of paper, that means very little to most people today. They do it for the children. They do it for a sense that if they do have children, it somehow gives some security. But again, that's just another underlying statement of how unequal we are, that we can't have protection for children outside of an institution that has such a dark history. A polyamorous situation, for example, if people really believe in the benefits to children, would be even more beneficial. We would have a situation where there are more adults involved in the, in the relationship and therefore more role models and more support to the child. Yet, some, somehow, people who are pro-marriage rarely, if ever, support the idea of multiple partner marriages. They rarely support the idea of gay marriages. So really, the idea that marriage creates social cohesion or somehow benefits society is not really true. It has an underlying... There is an underlying aspect to that. And the underlying aspect is really that it's about tradition or it's about religious ideology. Religion itself, a lot of the ideas I just spoke about in terms of how unequal and how abusive to women marriage has been in the past, a lot of those ideas come directly from marriage. Um, there's numerous passages in the Bible depicting how women could even be executed for not being virgins on their wedding night. To, to, say, to say that these ideas are beneficial to society or beneficial to children is absolutely immoral to me and abhorrent. 
I, I feel that marriage represents little, little to do with love, little to do with equality, and little to do with any of the positive traits of our society, and therefore I would have nothing to do with it. That, that is my essential position on marriage. That is where I, where I come from, both personally and emotionally. Um, we cannot divorce ourselves from, from the history of what we're talking about because at the end of the day, um, it is an insult to, to what people have gone through, to the struggles. And as well, we should not forget that across the world, people are still being abused in marriage situations. I'm just talking on a, on a brief level about the situation in this country or the situation within Christian cultures or previously Christian cultures. But if we, if we look around the world, there are still people who have no choice um, even within my own family, my own mother was forced into an abusive marriage because at 16 years old, because that's what you do. That was what was considered the right thing to do, regardless of what the potential husband would be like. It was about convention, it was about society at the time that she was growing up. And I can only be happy and rejoice in the fact that that no longer exists, that my mother now would not be forced into a situation like that. Um, luckily she went on to have a very long-term relationship that was very, very unstressful and happy. So, um, but, but ultimately, um, there is also the fact that millions of people live in seriously unhappy marriages. There's statistics that say up to 50% of people that are married are actually unhappy in their marriage. We hear talk of how people stay together longer in their marriage. Well, that may be true, but what of the situation within the marriage? Are they happy? Are they truly in, in, in love in the sense that we like to think about it? Is the situation always better for the child if they have one? Isn't there situations that we're all aware of where someone has left a relationship in order to find a relationship that was better for them. You know, we can't make assumptions about what the meaning of someone staying together is. Sometimes people do it purely for financial reasons. Again, in, in, in studies it has been shown that some people only stay together because they feel that they will have financial benefit from it. This is not, this is not a, a positive thing. This is not a thing that benefits our society. This is a thing that holds us back. And we should not be scared of the future. We should not be scared of moving forward into a society that is free of marriage. Falling back on tradition just because it feels safe and secure is not something that any one of us should really champion. I 
think one important point to rebuke from the other side is that divorce is not a completely different equation than marriage. When we're talking about marriage today, why can't we talk about divorce? Isn't one of the points about marriage today and why it's so much better is because you can get out of it. And surely that's why it's much more valuable, because if you have to stay in a marriage, and that's the reason that you're in it, well, what's good about that? If we look at why the majority of young people want to get married, it's to make a commitment. This is fundamentally, as I said, different from the past. This is not some of the reasons that were predominantly the reason for getting married, other than convention, perhaps religion, tradition, feeling that this is what your parents would like you to do. We look at attitudes there, those, those reasons are absolutely insignificant. People are choosing to marry because they want to make a commitment. And a significant element about that is because apparently people feel that getting married, and this is the majority, of course there are lots of exceptions, is different from living together. They feel that living together is important, but in many ways they see living together as the trial period. Live together, feel whether you can stand being under the same roof as your partner, whether you can face each other in the morning on a long-term basis, and then decide whether you want to break up or whether you want to marry. And actually, this is one of the reasons that we've seen a massive decline in marriage rate. Because people are finding out, and this is a great thing by living together, that actually they don't want to commit to this person, so they break up. Surely that's a positive. But to misunderstand that as meaning that we no longer are interested in marriage is to fundamentally misunderstand what's going on in terms of trends. So, commitment is something which seems to be the top reason. And the important thing, again, just to reiterate about commitment, is that you can break that commitment. We need to be realistic about marriage, and I think that that's sometimes where the debate becomes problematic. If we're talking about people's aspirations, they go into marriage hoping that they're going to stay together forever. But there is no guarantee, and we aren't in, let's say, a uber religious society where the expectation is that you must stay together if that's what that particular religion is asking for. This is a commitment to the other person, and your ideal, your aspiration, is to stay together. You may separate, and we see that all the time. But that doesn't mean that marriage isn't something that people are pursuing. That doesn't mean that marriage isn't an aspiration. But something which is very interesting is to look at this country as compared to other countries. France, for example, people are, in many cases, outrightly rejecting marriage. They think of it as a political institution. They don't want to be involved in it. And so they are seeing a legal parallel institution which is cohabiting. Okay, it's not an institution, but people feel strongly about it. But interestingly, in this country, that doesn't seem to be what we feel. We think that actually marriages are going to be as equal or as unequal as the rest of society. But if we are in an unequal relationship before we get married, when we get married, that relationship is going to be unequal. If we are in an equal relationship before we get married, that relationship in terms of marriage is going to be equal. In other words, we seem to recognize that marriage is not a vacuum. A relationship is only going to be as good as your relationship, and that's part of the way that marriage has become deinstitutionalized today, and is about personal relationships, your relationship. And that's actually where I disagree with a lot of the stats on marriage. I think that if you're in a bad relationship and you get married, you're going to be in a bad marriage. I think if you're in a good relationship and you get married, you're going to be in a good relationship. Marriage, in my view, and I, in my reading of the statistics, is not transformative. I think that that's one of the difficulties around the debate, is that in some ways it's being sold as doing something which people then get married and find that it doesn't happen necessarily. And that's very important because that's why people feel it's something they can find with person. Yeah. Jermaine Greer, interestingly, has definitely, I think, been very realistic in terms of her depiction of marriage in the past. She's a feminist who was worried about gender equality, and we saw massive amounts of gender equality, exploitation, all the things which the speaker before talked about, that were absolutely true. 
But if you listen to what Jermaine Greer says today about marriage, and many feminists who are married themselves say about marriage, it's because they're recognising that actually things can alter according to whether society becomes more progressive itself. So I think it is important that we've moved on in terms of our perceptions of marriage as an institution to seeing marriage as something which is actually much more about our personal relationships. And in seeing that, that's why in our responses, in surveys, we're saying that the reason we want to get married is because we want to make a personal commitment. A lot is made of weddings, a lot is made of the public aspect, but actually when you get down to brass tacks, it sounds like in this country, what people are caring about when they're trying to make that commitment or decide whether to make that commitment is the personal relationship. And that's what seems to be the important aspect of it. It's also worth bearing in mind in terms of traditions, in terms of all the other things which we might feel are colouring our decisions about whether we want to get married or not, that the vast majority of marriages today are civil. 67% I think of marriages today are nothing to do with religion, at least in, in, in the sense of the wedding. That's pretty significant because that suggests strongly that that's a big departure from the past. Because in the past there certainly was a very wrapped up relationship it's not a bad thing, but it's a difference in terms of realities and in terms of people's traditions about marriage. So, to sum up, and to also put marriage in the context of society today, it's very significant that in surveys, when we find that the majority of young people, 20 to 35 years, want to get married, they don't think that married people generally are happier. They want to get married but what they don't want to do is thrust marriage down other people's throats, and they don't think, realistically in my view, that a marriage is going to transform a relationship. It's back to this idea that your relationship before you go into marriage is going to be quite similar to the one that you have in marriage. People recognise that, and that's why I think it's important to remember that stability, really, is something that you're going to find in marriage, and stability is denoted by marriage, yes. So Because it's, people want to make a commitment. Earlier I was saying that if you're in a living together relationship, when you make the decision that you want to make a commitment, that's when you decide to get married. So in some ways I wonder whether perhaps the proposal is the most important element. That's when you're both deciding that your intentions are both the same. You both want to stay together for the long haul. We know about cohabiting relationships that one of the main aspects about them is that quite often one partner has one vision of the relationship, possibly that it's long term, and the other partner thinks that maybe this is going to end. So, to end, I think that our views about marriage being personal, our views about not saying that marriage is going to be something that we necessarily feel that other people should have, our views most importantly that we can choose to marry is what makes marriage, I think we could say today, more popular actually than it's ever been because people are making a choice to get married. They don't have to get married anymore. How can you say that it was a choice and before you had to? Today, when there's so much talk in the media about the fact that marriage is dead, it seems pretty odd that 90% of 20 to 35 year olds say they want to get married.
I think this house would not get married in terms of not joining with all of the baggage. I think mean, it's important that there's a lot of baggage that goes with marriage as a former institution, so maybe a new institution, where um, you know, it's open to anyone in society, any kind of marriage, um, and the legal status of someone who's not married and wants to make a commitment to someone who's the same as someone who is married. Maybe that kind of institution of the future we could um, get on board with, but I think right now it's, it's a good point that we haven't left that baggage behind. And I think we should respect that parenting and um, relationships aren't determined by whether or not they're women married. Does anyone have a speech on behalf of the opposition? Uh, yeah, go for Albert. Uh, Albert Lillo, Vice College. Now, let's first ignore the fact that the opposition have clearly won by saying that the French dislike marriage. <laughs> I just want to deal on some of the economic aspects of marriage because, really, what encourages marriage and what you go into if you marry, it means you nurture each other in a family, it means you nurture your partner, your children, you encourage that aspiration, which makes families some of the most successful institutions in the world. I mean, look at how successful, say, the Lee family of Singapore have become, or the Obama family in America. I mean, the propositions have said uh, that there's no safety net for children who who uh, are not in the manager. But if, say, the government discouraged marriage, it would have to provide that safety net. Safety net. It would have to spend on unwanted children, which would encourage more unwanted, un unwanted children, uh, which would mean more unspending, which would mean higher taxes, and therefore uh, worse economy. Uh, so, clearly on the economic aspects, the fact that families are such successful, successful economic institutions, you should clearly vote for the opposition. Thank you. Now, we recognise marriage as a symbol of love. Um, and we know this trend of 
And the amazing thing around about Chatham and everyone's heard that was I'm not really equipment, I have a 24 month old by a full contract. <laughs> but I think really it depends what you put all sorts of safety and down on it just depends on whether you think the reason our institution could put the tire shown off another thing we do with the tire, which is equally as good as expressing that sort of commitment. <laughs> religious 
idea, but in a secular society, the focus should not be on giving the religious institution the preference over the secular one. If we are a truly secular society, why give that religious institution more rights than a civil communion between two people than in a secular way? I'm not saying get rid of it. Let the people who want to be married get married. Go for it. But for the rest of us, why can't we do something which is not religiously inspired to show our love for one another and do all these great things that people have been saying about people being in a happy, cohabiting relationship? You can. <laughs> Anastasia said 63% of marriages now are not a religious ceremony. Yes, but they are, they are marriages. So you support these different parties? Yes. Really are. very much indeed. Um, to misquote Oscar Wilde, bigamy is having one spouse too many. Monogamy is the same. <laughs> I'm a divorce lawyer, so you might be forgiven for thinking, well, why is he against marriage? I mean, that's where he makes his money. Fair comment, up to a point. But my job does provide me with a certain insight into the marriages that go wrong. Um, they are the marriages that go wrong. My clients aren't always the best advertisements for a happy marriage. But we all know that marriage is tough. A well-known marriage guidance professional wrote recently, our research findings confirm that marriage is problematic in that the reality of married life, the division of labour, the amount of time available for the couple alone, fails to meet people's aspirations. This seems particularly true for women whose desire for intimacy and a common life is especially difficult to achieve. Now, over the last 25 years, marriage rates have fallen considerably, an 83% decrease since 1972. So cohabitation has, to a large extent, replaced marriage. It's replaced marriage as the most common living arrangement for partners. Almost half of marriages will end in divorce, and the Office for National Statistics claims that if death and divorce rates carry on as they are at the moment, then only 10% of couples marrying in 2008 are going to reach their diamond wedding anniversaries. Good news for the lawyers, not very good news for married people. Let's just remind ourselves of the proposition and remember where we are. This house would not get married. This house. This is probably the best university in Europe in the world. <laughs> you, you undergraduates and postgraduates, you're, you're in a unique position. You're probably fed up with being told that, but you are. As Arthur Daly in Minder would have said, the world's your lobster. You have endless opportunities ahead for you. How will marriage fit into that? We've got to ask, what's the point of marriage for you? And when Charles Darwin was thinking of getting married at the age of 29, he got a piece of paper and he made a list of pros and cons on it. One of the pros was that a wife would be an object to be beloved and played with. <laughs> Better than a dog, anyhow. But as a downside, oh, such a terrible loss of time. But he consoled himself with the thought that if he became a slave to marriage, there were many happy slaves in the world. You may say, fine, that was 1838. What about now? Will marriage be right for you? What is society's attitude now towards married people and how are they looked at compared with unmarried people? Equality of the sexes, at least in terms of attitude, is a given in many quarters. I suggest not in family law, which is the area that I practice in. The courts are supposed to be gender neutral, so just bear that in mind. In 1905, a Court of Appeal judge in a divorce case said that the wife needed protecting because she was the weaker vessel in the marriage, and long may wives continue so to be. Now, we might dismiss that as Edwardian nonsense, but what are the judges like today? Take, for example, the 2002 case of the married couple where the wife had the high income and the husband stayed at home to look after the children by agreement. They divorced. The wife wanted to give up her good job and go and live in Scotland. Husband wanted to stay in England. 
She wanted the children. Who was going to have residence, which is the new word we have for, for custody, who was going to have residence for the children? Now, if the roles had been reversed, there would have been absolutely no question of the husband getting residence, none whatsoever, of course. What the judge said was, we must not ignore the realities, namely, the very different role and functions of men and women. And he went on to say that everybody with a lucrative job worries about the effect it has on the family, and that was his excuse for saying the mother gets the kids and she can go to Scotland. There's also the famous case of Radmacher in Granatina that's been very well publicised, where the German heiress got to keep her £100 million, and the husband was just given enough to support him while the children were young. In the reverse situation, the outcome would have been completely different. On that point? Yeah. Um, do you think the situation of uh, Corrality is breaking up is any better? I mean, if you were to take the I'm coming on to this. I'm coming on to this. Judges in this country do tend to look on a married woman in a paternalistic, protective, and patronising manner. Well, I'm... <laughs> judges are essentially our representatives in many respects. There are so many judges throughout the country, and it's almost uniform, this attitude among them. They're part of the establishment. In the way that they're part of the establishment, it seems to be very relevant how they apply the law and the attitudes that they have. So even when the wife is a financially stronger party, they still regard her almost as the weaker vessel, as I mentioned before. This may be to her financial advantage on divorce, but is that right and is that fair? Not just for the husband, but also for her. Marriage could be and should be seen as a real partnership of equals, but is it? Does anyone really remain independent and in control of his or her own destiny in the context of marriage. The days of an individual's destiny and status being defined by marriage may not be over completely, but they should be. We're not living in a Jane Austen society where the woman has a, only a minor place in society if she doesn't marry, a world where, like Willoughby in Sense and Sensibility, a, a man marries an heiress he can't bear the sight of because he perceives no other option. You're living in a world where you can decide what's best for you and where you have many other options. London is said to be the divorce capital of the world. And I do know quite a few rich people, mainly men, who will not move to England because they're afraid of what might happen if they get divorced here. Many rich people who live here already refuse to get married for exactly the same reason. You might think, well, these divorce laws are okay for the weaker financial party weaker financial party, very often the, the wife, gets a good deal. But the reality is, the richer party is fleeced, and the financially weaker party, particularly if she's a woman, is treated patronisingly as a creature quite incapable of survival other than through lifelong support from the richer party. A person in a weaker financial position should be dealt with fairly, but not excessively generously. You try telling a Swedish banker that he's going to have to support his former wife at a rate of £250,000 a year for the rest of her life, when in Sweden there is no such thing as ongoing maintenance. Now, what's the, the other thing that's important is that somebody should be treated fairly, and it should not depend on what sex they are. Everybody should be treated equally, and they very much are not at the moment. So what's the difference, really, between marriage and long-term cohabitation. Now, the, the Conservatives, before the election, heralded tax breaks for married couples to send out the message that marriage was supported by the tax system for the benefit of children. But research from the Institute for Fiscal Studies in response to that concludes that marriage itself doesn't make relationships more stable. And Ed Balls recently said, and I agree, that it's not the legal form, it's the strength and stability, stability of a relationship itself which is the most important. But let's just look at cohabitation and how it compares with marriage, particularly from the lawyer's point of view. <coughs> You've already heard about Sir Nicholas Wall, the president of the family division, saying more rights for cohabiting couples. Vulnerable people who think they have rights against one another need protecting. I agree with him. There has to be protection for vulnerable people 
And it doesn't only need to be in the context of marriage, it must be in the context of cohabitation as well. That will happen, that will come, and that will come soon. And I don't agree with Richard's point that it's not going to happen because cohabitation can't be defined. It's happened in nearly every other country in the world. If it can happen in Ireland, if it can happen in Spain, if it can happen in um, Portugal, then there's no reason why it shouldn't happen with us. Mrs. Burns, a cohabiting woman, two children, agreed she would give up work. At the end of that relationship, they separated. She was entitled to nothing. And the reason for that was that she wasn't actually married. Now, why doesn't this law, be, why doesn't this law change before? The Law Commission made recommendations that were shelved because of the pro-marriage lobby that said marriage is so important that you're devaluing marriage by bringing in this sort of law. And other people are saying, oh, well, let's not bother with cohabitants because they can get married if they want. They can't. So, as I say, marriage fleeces the richer party and patronises the poorer party. I don't say do without love, heaven forbid. I certainly don't say do without children, even though they might not be the insurance policy they've been for several thousand years. I do say think carefully about what you're doing in the context of an institution that does not foster equality, that does not foster independence, and which you of all people do not need in the traditional sense for protection of the weaker party. Each of you is in a position of strength. Make your own decisions about your future and be in control of your own lives. Thank you. I was uh, very interested to hear my colleague on uh, this side of the house talk of the polyamorous position. I've not heard of the polyamorous position before, and I'm very much looking forward to getting home tonight and trying it out. Uh, I was going to start by saying, what are we slow in Cambridge, aren't we? <laughs> I was going to start by saying that unconventionally I'm going to agree with the motion, but I have to say that there have been so many... Um, misconceptions on this side that I have to correct a few of them. Though it's interesting, isn't it, that proposing, we have a gentleman who earns his living by divorce, a gentleman whose mother was forced into an abusive relationship as a minor, and a gentleman who on his own admission was told by Ladbrokes that his chance for a successful marriage was two to one against. <laughs> and all men. Um, just to correct a few, I actually ran out of paper, but just to correct a few things, Henry VIII did not invent divorce. Um, <clears throat> what else have we got here? That uh, marriage doesn't protect women. You may be interested to hear that you're, you're four times safer as a woman from violence if you happen to get married. Um, what else have we got? Oh, I love the thing about Darwin. Uh, it reminded me of Jasper Carrot saying, what was it you said about Darwin that he wanted, his wife was a wonderful plaything? Jasper Carrot said, it's just as well we men don't have breasts. We just play with them all day long. <laughs> and um, perhaps most, oh yes, the women weren't ed educated in the 1900s. Most men were not educated in the 1900s. Uh, George Eliot, Jane Austen, Queen Victoria, goodness me, women were not educated. But um, what I would like to say actually is I will offer... Um, £100 or a packet of Smarties, whichever you prefer, your choice, to uh, the first person who comes to me this evening and can name a single woman in the Old Testament executed for not being a virgin on her wedding night. Now, I, I do unconventionally want to start... No, where does it say that? Give me chapter and verse where the Old Testament says a woman will be executed for not being a um, virgin on her wedding night. Yeah, I'll give you time to look that up. Um, there you go, it's right there. That's not for not being a virgin, that's for virginity. adultery. It says virginity. Virgin on her wedding night. Well, I think that's for committing adultery. Okay, well, we'll discuss this afterwards and I will give you either a hundred pounds or a packet of Smarties. But you can't, the truth is you cannot give me a single example of a woman to whom that was, that, to whom that was done. Okay, but it was never, 
it was never actually done to a single you know? woman. Because I said, what I said was, give me an instance where it was done. There is no instance where it was actually done. Well, I mean, it's like, I mean, if we go back into history, it would be interesting to see. Do you find that, me a that single... That's the biblical opinion. It says it's there is no single instance of that being put well, to effect. You said just now that it wasn't in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. It, it's not in the Bible. A single instance of it ever being put into effect. So anyway, let's move on for that. But you have no evidence for saying that. There is no instance of that ever being done to a single woman in the Old Testament. Now, however, having said that, I do want to start by, uh, to a certain extent, agreeing with the proposition that uh, this house would not get married. And I do very much respect the position of not being married for two reasons. One is because, um, now I'm coming to this unashamedly from a Judeo-Christian point of view. I realize that that won't necessarily be authoritative for most people here. But I'm coming to it because, one, that is my position. So I'm sharing with you where I'm coming from. And two, because I think it is the most attractive uh, uh, relationship, actually, that has ever been described on this earth. So I'm coming from an unashamedly Judeo-Christian position. And St. Paul radically says, in 1 Corinthians 7, Christians are free not to marry. Now, in the first century, that, that was really revolutionary. It's actually revolutionary in most societies and most faiths today. We were privileged last year to have an Orthodox Muslim living with us. Abdul was 25. He was, had no thoughts of settling down or being responsible or actually wanting to get married. The last time he went home to Pakistan, his father said, you're 25, it's time you got married. And he said, yes, sir, okay. Now, that is what most societies and most faiths believe that we all have a duty to get married. St. Paul cut right against that and said, you are free not to marry. And even more revolutionary, women are free not to marry. So that's one reason why I want to say, to a certain extent, I agree with the proposition. The other reason is that marriage is such an extraordinarily demanding relationship. And again, to quote St. Paul, in Ephesians 5, he's, he lays down almost the most outrageous claims for marriage, if you like. To women, he says, submit to your husband, as to Christ, isn't that a shocking thing to say? That I am to obey my husband as I would if Christ came down to this earth? Even more demandingly, he says to husbands, lay down your wives, lives for your wives. Has it ever occurred to you to wonder why in 1912 an entire ship went down full of men who thought nothing of dying so that women and children could get on a lifeboat? That is totally counter most cultures. Most cultures, the strong protect themselves. But that was a generation of men bred on hundreds of years of the Christian teaching that men lay down their lives for their wives. With my body, I be worship, is what men say in the common prayer book of marriage. That's what you do to God. You worship God. This is the most demanding relationship ever described. And so I can respect people who vote with the motion. I can respect you for saying, that's too big a demand. Or, I have the freedom to be single. So why is it then that the research shows over and over and over again that marriage is so beneficial? If it is that demanding, why is it so popular and why is it so beneficial? I haven't got time this evening to go into all the research, but you can go home and look it up yourself. Uh, for instance, I mean, you can just Google it, the advantages of marriage. Or you can look at, for instance, a paper by uh, Waite and Gallagher, which shows, I think they, uh, they um, off the top of my head, 10 uh, advantages of marriage. You're richer, you're safer, you're, you live longer, your mental health is better, your physical health is better, your sex is better, your children are happy, so on and so on and so forth. As I say, don't take my word for it, go home and look it up. Why is it so beneficial? I'm just going to talk about three reasons, and I'm going to be rather personal about this. As I say, everybody on the opposition is male, and we've been told that marriage is abusive to women. And I want to say from a personal point of view, no, it isn't. It's terrifically fulfilling and liberating and satisfying for three reasons. And rather conventionally, I'm going to take the three reasons that are in the Book of Common Prayer because they happen to coincide with my experience. The first is children. Richard um, touched on this. Somebody up here said that, uh, uh, why do we think women should be brought up by... Uh, uh, sorry, children should be brought up by a married couple because, ladies and gentlemen, the research shows 
overwhelmingly that this is what children need and want. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you in a minute. You've had your chance to have your say. I'll come back to you if I have time at the end. Overwhelmingly, in every imaginable area, your life expectancy is better if your parents are married, your educational prospects are better, your own chances of forming a happy relationship, your mental health, your career, everything is better if your parents are together and they're far more likely to stay together if you're married. There is no question about it. Again, don't take my word for it. Go home and look it up. You will find straight away all the evidence overwhelmingly for the benefit of children if their parents are married. I wrote a book um, recently uh, on child rearing, and my research showed me this so strongly that actually, now I, I've met all sorts of parents. We lived in an inner city vicarage for 14 years, and we met life at the top and the bottom. And you read in the tabloid that there are all sorts of awful sexist parents out there. I've never met them. The parents I meet from every walk of life, the most deprived and the most privileged, all want the best for their children. And the, the research was so overwhelming that I said in my book, the one single most important thing you can do to benefit your children is to get married and stay married. They will have every advantage in life. And if that's the only thing you do for your children, they will be extremely privileged. So that, that is the first thing. I, when I was your age, I didn't think much about having children. I sort of assumed I would one day. I had no idea what an incredibly wonderful, fulfilling thing it is to have children, because for the first time in your life, you care about some, another human being more than you do about yourself. And that is a terrifically liberating, fulfilling thing. So that's the first thing. The second thing, the second um, benefit of marriage, and I wanted to call it, these are an increasing order of importance. I wanted to make this the last and the most important, because in my sort of daily experience, that's what it feels like. But in the end, my head will my heart. So I'm putting this as the second, not the most important. The second thing is sex. You will get much more sex if you are married, <laughs> believe me. Uh, 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 the, du uh, the Durex uh, study of 2001 showed that you'll get twice as much sex if you're married than if you're single. The Kinsey report, which is rather more complicated, but shows again, overwhelmingly, sex is much more frequent and much better if you're married. Take your age group, 18 to 22. If you were married, you would be getting 10 times as much sex as you are now. You would be twice. <laughs> Maybe not you individually, sir, but on average. Okay. I don't know how much sex it is. I very much doubt it's more than I have. something else that one of my colleagues on this side said that sexual prowess diminishes as you get older. Believe me, no, it doesn't. <laughs> so not only do you get a lot more... I'm sorry, two of my children are on this side and they're distracting me. <laughs> but if one only got married for the sex, it would be worth it. Well worth it over and over again. And not just a lot more sex but a lot more satisfying sex. Again, the Kinsey report shows that 50% 50, 50 of married men are satisfied with their sex life, and in 39% of cohabiting men. And that cohabit cohabiting men, you'd think, would get quite a lot of sex. But it's not as satisfying. With women, it's 42 against 39. So the sex is worth it. And the third reason is what the Book of Common Prayer calls the mutual support, the society help and support. This is the most important thing. Funnily enough, that same Kinsey report showed that most people would prefer to be spending time with friends than having sex, oddly. When you're married, you're doing both at the same time. The friendship that you get... Yes, you, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Funnily enough, uh, just going back to some of the points that have been raised, I, I, I'm taking my definition of marriage, again, from the Judeo-Christian definition, which is not the piece of paper. The, def the Judeo-Christian definition of sex is a public lifelong exclusive commitment. That's what it is. More than it's a legal thing, more than it's a piece of paper, more than anything. It's that... I beg your pardon? I'm running Oh, help! Okay. Well, I think I've made the three points I wanted to make. I'll just finish by telling you a story. Uh, you know how marriage came about. Adam was uh, lonely in the Garden of Eden, and um, he, he said to God, you know, I'm terribly lonely, and God said, yes, it's awful. I'm going to get you a, a wonderful companion. She's going to be beautiful. She's going to be sexy. She's going to support you sex on tap, everything you want, you know, always tell you you're clever and brilliant and so on and, and never contradict you and everything. He said, blimey, 
that's wonderful. How much does a woman like that cost? It must be an arm and a leg. And God said, um, sorry, son, it's more than an arm and a leg. It's both arms, both legs, your head, your heart, your soul, your body, everything. And Adam said, um, what would I get for a rib? 